Do you know what meeting falling in love is? It's a movie term for when two strangers, usually the main characters, meet in funny or strange circumstances. They, of course, find a common language. Perhaps there is a moment when time freezes and they look into each other's eyes. And then, like a bolt of lightning in a clear sky, they realize that they are made for each other. You know what I'm talking about. You've seen this a million times, especially if you watch movies. The woman who became my wife met me in this situation. Only this was not accidental. This was completely planned. I was influenced even before we introduced ourselves to each other. I was in my early 20s, fresh out of college, and already a workaholic. Work was my main priority. What I did was difficult and demanding work. After work, I went to the gym. Then I'd come home to a microwave dinner and a movie. This was my life. I told myself that I didn't have time to date, even if I could find a young woman who would put up with me and my weird job. I was a loner, which was very useful for my employer. No dates meant fewer security checks. Working and training was pretty much all I did. After several years of living like this, I was a little tired of my life, so I decided to join a wine club. I joined just for variety. I didn't join the club to meet girls or because I felt lonely. I just needed something to do after my daily gym workout other than watching movies. That was my only reason for joining the club, I swear. I worked about 60 hours a week. Where? You can't tell this to anyone. If I tell anyone, I'll have to kill him. This isn't really a joke. What I can tell you is that I am an analyst. I analyze things. At the time I met the woman who became my wife, I was working for an agency located in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. This region includes a large area and many federal agencies. So when I say I was an analyst at an agency located in the metropolitan area, I'm not really saying anything. This is why I can share this personal information. I can also say that at that time I had been working for a little over a year. I graduated from college with a liberal arts degree from a fairly prestigious private institution. I thought I would go into law, but the agency had other plans for me. It turned out that I met many of their requirements, including attention to detail and a flair for languages. I think it's worth mentioning that by the age of 24, I spoke four languages fluently and could communicate in three or four more if necessary. Being a polyglot is a good thing, even if most of the languages I spoke aren't particularly popular outside of national security circles. A lot of my time at work was then spent learning languages. I rode in college, so I was in pretty good shape. Not that it matters much. I spent 95% of my day sitting at my desk at SIF. At the time I was 24 years old and in good shape. I'm just under 6 feet tall and weigh about 180 pounds. I have dark brown hair and eyes of the same color. I had a college degree and a job that paid well at least for government service. I'll never get rich like a Beltway bandit lawyer, but I loved my job. I liked making a difference, even if almost no one outside the Beltway understood exactly what it was. This is the situation I was in when I came to the next wine club event. The wine club met approximately every six to eight weeks. I came there because it was something new for me and also because I was interested in learning more about wine. At that time, I knew what kind of wine I liked to drink, but I didn't understand why I liked one wine and didn't like another. So it was both fun and educational. It was better than working late at the office or sitting at home watching the Hallmark Channel. That evening, the wine club met at the French Embassy, which is located in the northwestern part of Georgetown. I didn't know much about French wines back then, so I was very interested in the tasting and the sommelier's comments. I mean French wine at the French Embassy, with French cheeses and baguettes. Yes, please. The fact that nearly 70% of the club's members were women didn't hurt. I wasn't there to meet girls, but the atmosphere was nice, if you know what I mean. The downside of tasting French wine at the French Embassy was that the event was popular. Tickets had sold out months in advance. I showered after the gym. The taxi dropped me off 30 minutes before the event started, but there was already a line of very thirsty people ahead of me. There was real chaos going on inside. There were too many people. Everyone tried to try as many wines as possible. 
The lines at the filling stations were really long. The scene reminded me of an event that happened a couple of months ago when we were tasting tequila at the Mexican embassy. I was standing in line when someone bumped into me. I felt the wine get on my jacket and trousers. Damn it, I hope it's not red wine. Then I saw who crashed into me. She said something about how sorry she was and how awkward she was, but I couldn't hear anything because I was looking into her eyes. They were great, dark chocolate with warm brown reflections. Then I noticed the rest, and it was as beautiful as her eyes. She was half a head shorter than me, but her dress perfectly emphasized her figure. Her chest threatened to burst out. You might think that I'm focusing my attention on her beautiful breasts, but that's not the case. Sorry to disappoint your male stereotypes. After her eyes, I noticed her hair. She wore them long. Her hair fell past her shoulders and was the color of an old copper coin, somewhere between brown and red, with beautiful reflections that reflected the ceiling light. First I noticed her eyes, then her hair. Then I noticed the rest. She was slender, with perky breasts standing proudly on her chest. Under her mid-length skirt, she had long and graceful legs. Yes, I fell in love at first sight, just like in those movies. I got my wine and brought her another wine, both white, thank God, and we sat down to talk. I learned her name was Kate Short for Catherine, and she learned my name was Neil. She worked as an executive assistant for NC's level civilian employee at the Pentagon, and I told her I worked for the state administration, which was technically true, but extremely vague. She nodded understandingly, and I didn't have to say any more on the subject. She changed the subject from work, and we talked about what we like to do when we're not working or drinking wine. As it turned out, we both had the same extracurricular interests, nothing special. On weekends, she rode bikes with the group, that's all. She liked to read. When she wasn't working, she kept to herself a quiet life. We got up several times for more. I switched to Bordeaux, but she stayed with the Whites. She seemed to like Sansara. Then we got to Burgundy, and we both found our passions. She loved Chardonnay, and I fell in love with Pinot. We returned again and again to the Burgundy line. By the time the event ended, we were both already halfway through, but we exchanged contact information. She pecked me on the cheek, and that was the end of it. It was a nice meeting, and she organized it. It was not by chance that she ran into me, the wine didn't just spill out on its own. The entire episode was planned. I learned about her manipulations after we got married. I reported the contact. Of course I did. I wasn't allowed to waltz into a foreign embassy just because I had a ticket to a public event. If I had significant contact with a stranger at a foreign embassy, that also had to be reported. Hello, honey trap. I needed to make sure Kate was who she said she was before we took it one step further. Luckily, Kate's background check came back clean. She was who she said she was. She did what she said. The best part was that she already had a TS clearance based on what she was doing and who she was working for. As far as the agency is concerned, I was given the green light. I did just that. Kate's parents didn't like me. Not at all. First of all, I was not Catholic. I'm officially agnostic because I'm waiting for a sign from above. The wait was long. Secondly, they never understood what I did for a living. My vague statement about analysis did not resonate with them. Kate's family has always been a working class family. Traditionalists. Kate was the first in her family to receive a higher education and she had to fight her parents to get it. Secondly, I didn't speak Spanish at least as far as they knew. The reality was that I spoke freaking fluent Spanish with a bad Cuban accent, but I decided not to share that information with them. When they said all sorts of nonsense about me in Spanish, I pretended not to say anything. So, as far as they knew, I didn't speak Spanish and their English wasn't very good, despite living in the US most of their lives. We didn't have much to say to each other, and I liked that. Yes, Kate is Latina, so what the hell? Do you think I care? I didn't care, but they worried. They hated the fact that their precious daughter had married a pale-skinned gringo. They didn't like the fact that we slept with each other and moved in together long before I proposed to her. In their opinion, I spoiled their innocent daughter. 
I may have spoiled Kate, but if I did, she would be a 100% willing participant. We had sex on the fourth date. After a pleasant dinner, I took her to my home, a small apartment in Arlington. We shared a bottle of new assault that I brought to the restaurant. This wine education began to bear fruit. We returned to my place and made love. Who am I kidding? She had men before me. Then she told me that I was much better in bed than her other lovers. Did she tell me the truth? I don't know. Anyway, we had sex and we liked it. We liked each other. Was it love? I don't know. I don't even know what love is. Life is not a movie. I just know that after four months of dating and even more sex, I wanted to be with her all the time. We were compatible in a thousand different ways, from our love of working out at the gym after work to our love of wine to our ability to not ask any questions about each other's workdays. We had jobs, and we both tended to work late, but when we were home it was like a house to me. Kate felt at home. Before Kate, my life was busy, with occasional club wine-tasting events. After Kate, my life consisted of working, training, and having sex with Kate. We both stopped going to wine club events because we decided we'd rather buy the wine ourselves and taste it at home. Wine tasting became a date for us. Her parents didn't like me, and they didn't like the fact that we were having sex. They didn't like us living together four months after our first date. They didn't like me a lot about me. Her father, Julio, was fine. He was actually a good guy. Short, round, and very pleasant. He owned a small optical store in Crystal City where he sold and repaired glasses. He was good at it and provided excellent customer service. Julio was a nice man, and I think we could have gotten along, but he did what Maria told him. Maria Kate's mother ruled the family like a dictator. She was the boss. Everyone did what Maria said. Maria had red hair. Her hair was so fiery red that I wondered if she had dyed it. Kate was born to her early, so she was about 41 or 42 years old when Kate and I first met. She was a redhead, and her behavior confirmed the stereotypes of fiery redheads. She had huge breasts that required a bra the size of Cleveland to support, as well as massive hips and a huge ass that was bigger than the local park. Combine that ass with those breasts and put the result in a five-foot-tall frame, add lava red hair on top, and you've got a pretty good picture of Maria. Maria gave birth to a son approximately five years after Kate was born. Juanito graduated from high school and at 18 joined the Army, the infantry. He was always away, either on a business trip or on some mob or fob aconis. No one really saw him, which is why Mario and Julio adored Kate, and why they were so angry at me when we moved in together without a wedding ring. But what Maria hated most about me was not that I had sex with her precious daughter, but that I slept with Kate, ignoring her imperial orders. Julio obeyed her without question, as if he had been well-trained. And I ignored her, and it drove her crazy. From Maria's point of view, I just didn't care about Kate's entire family. I didn't care, and neither did Kate. Our approach to family dynamics was, screw them. Did they want us to come over for family dinner on Sunday? Sorry, we already have plans. Would you like to go to church with us? Sorry, Neil isn't Catholic, and Neil will never damn well become a Catholic, so stop pestering us. Okay, we didn't say that last part out loud to Maria and Julio, but we did say it out loud to each other when we finished talking to them. Kate was mine, and I was hers. We didn't need a family. My parents lived in New Hampshire, and we exchanged Christmas cards. We talked on the phone on our birthdays. Kate and I agreed that this was the right level of communication between children and parents. In the end, Kate and I got married, if only so that Maria would stop pestering Kate about her precious daughter living in sin. We had a civil ceremony instead of a huge Catholic mass. We held a reception at a local restaurant. Maria hated the casual wedding and the low-key reception as much as everything else she hated about me. But do you know how much money we saved thanks to these solutions? A bunch. Enough for a wonderful honeymoon in the Caribbean. This is how much we saved. On my honeymoon, I learned the truth about my wife. She was not the most reliable person on the planet. After our conversations, I had difficulty determining what was true. 
I mean, more often than not, she had an ulterior motive, or so it seemed to me. I had difficulty deciphering her intentions. However, I'm not sure my understanding was all that important. In bed, she was ready to do almost everything I wanted, with the exception of a couple of things. Everything else was available for our mutual pleasure. When we finished having sex, the other side of her opened up. In that hotel room in the Caribbean, she told me things about herself about us that shocked me. We were talking late at night, or maybe early in the morning, when Kate finally explained to me that she had targeted me at one of the early wine club events. She saw me and decided she wanted to get to know me better. So at the next event at the French Embassy, she staged a meeting by spilling wine on me. According to Kate, she never planned to fall in love with me or marry me. I just wanted some sex, she told me in that Caribbean hotel room. You looked sexy and I wanted you. I haven't had sex for more than two years, and then you showed up, so sexy. Rest? I didn't plan this. I didn't expect you to be so cool in bed. She shook her head. I didn't expect to fall in love with you the way I did. She kissed me tenderly. We'll spend our whole lives together, Neil. I didn't count on this. I never thought. She sighed. I never thought I could be a one-man girl. What if you get tired of me? I joked. Kate didn't smile. She thought for a few seconds and then said, If I get tired of you of us, I'll probably find another man to sleep with on the side. What? Well, seriously, she told me that on our honeymoon, for God's sake, you can do that too, she said. Just because we're married doesn't mean we have to be monogamous. I literally had no words. She continued, I love having sex with you. But if I want to sleep with someone else, or you want to sleep with someone else, then that should be okay. Just, let's make sure we both use protection. No unplanned pregnancies, no illnesses. A little discreet fling every now and then should be okay for all of us, right? I was lying next to her on the bed, but at that moment it seemed that I was a million miles away from her, seeing her face as if I was looking through a telescope. My happy world from the movie just collapsed. Don't be upset, she said quietly. I'm here now. I'm with you because I want to be here. I chose you. I said yes when you proposed, and I meant it. I will be your loving wife for the rest of your life. Whatever happens in the future is simply possible. Right now we are here on our honeymoon, and I want to make love to you one more time. Life continued after our wedding. I received a promotion at work, which meant I moved up one step on my GS pay scale. Kate jumped a step in her pay grid. We both worked and our expenses weren't too high. No car loans, no student debt. We lived very well, financially. Our sexual chemistry remained explosive. With the exception of the above-mentioned cases, Kate was ready for anything. Some of her suggestions even scared me a little, at least until I tried them and realized that I liked it. As far as I know, she was faithful to me for the first few years of our marriage. I was, of course, faithful to her. Our honeyed conversation about discreet and safe affairs gradually faded into the background and was forgotten. We had a good life. It got even better when the agency moved us across the country to Los Angeles. We were now 2,000 miles from Maria and Julio. No more invitations to Sunday dinners. No more invitations to Mass. No more questions about what I do for a living. It seemed that the further we were from them, the better we all got along. Why did the agency move us? They say that they wanted me to be closer to the distance to reduce the distance. Since the contractor is remote, it made sense to move me closer to the action, so to speak. So we moved from Arlington, Virginia to Torrance, California. Locate Los Angeles Air Force Base on the map. Draw a circle with a five mile radius using LOFP as the center. Within this circle, you will find an office, usually an entire building owned by virtually every defense contractor in America. In this circle, you will find companies that you may have never heard of. Look up the term Federal Research and Development Center. You will find such a center inside this circle. You'll find Torrance Rubber Works and Huge Air Crash Company and other companies that no longer exist at least under those old monikers. 
You'll also find Los Angeles Airport and the headquarters of Mattel and DirecTV. But that doesn't count. Not for me. What you won't find in this circle are all the secret government offices, because they are hidden among all the other objects there, like camouflage. When we moved to Los Angeles, I worked in one of these disguised offices. Every morning I pulled into the contractor's parking lot. I showed my employee ID to the security guard at the gate. My badge stated that I was an employee of this company, although in fact I was not. I parked my car in the lot, just like the other thousands of employees who actually worked for this company. I walked to the building and applied my badge to the reader on the door so that the magnetic code would be read. Then I took the elevator up a couple of floors and got out. From the outside it looked like an ordinary floor of a tall building, a long corridor with various signs on the doors most of which were fake. Only a few doors on this floor actually opened. I walked towards one of these doors that said, Advanced Analysis Laboratory, and had a sign with the company name and logo on it. I applied the badge to the reader again. Now I need to enter a pin. The door opened, and I found myself in a small room with lockers. I opened my locker, put my phone and keys there. I also left my employee badge there, and took another badge that didn't look like a regular one. I also took out the key to my office. I applied the new badge to another reader, which compared my face with the photo on the badge. The light turned green, and I entered another PIN code. The door opened, and I walked into a small waiting room. There was a sofa and several armchairs. There was a water cooler. The thick carpet was sand-colored. Off to the side was a small kitchen with a microwave, cooler, coffee maker, a machine with sandwiches and other snacks, and a refrigerator for storing lunches. It looked like a typical corporate waiting area. Among other things, there were two well-armed and fully equipped guards in this waiting room. These guys were serious with pistols on their belts and machine guns at the ready. While they watched me carefully and suspiciously, I walked through the waiting room and applied my badge to another reader. I entered the third pin code. The light turned green and the guards relaxed. I knew that if the light turned red, the guns would be pointed at me. If the light flashes red twice, the guards will remove the fuses. If the light turns red for the third time, they will order me to lie down on the floor to be handcuffed. If I resisted their orders, they would start shooting. Like I said, these guys were serious, without any sense of humor, at all. I have never allowed this reader to flash red even once. When the light turned green and the door opened, I entered another corridor with a dozen doors on either side. I would find my door and touch the reader with my palm so that the system would recognize me, after which I would use the key to enter. Then I started working. This was my workplace on the West Coast. What was Kate doing while I was at work? The agency found her a job as an executive assistant to a senior vice president, a real, legitimate employee of the company. Working hours were normal and the salary was much higher. We needed that extra money. Even after adjusting for the cost of living, Los Angeles was much more expensive than Virginia. However, we found a decent two-story condo about 30 minutes from work. It was a mile from the beach, close enough to take weekend walks or bike rides along the coast. We have adjusted to our new life in Southern California. I have to say that everything was not bad at all. We both started to sunbathe. The food was amazing, the nightlife was great when we wanted it. Everything was going well for us. And then Kate started an affair. It's not like she didn't warn me that she wasn't a one-man woman. I don't know why I was so shocked when she told me this. She was just calm and indifferent to it. I was intimate with my boss this afternoon, she announced in the same tone in which she usually said that dinner was ready. I had no words. I just stood there and looked at my wife. She shrugged. There was nothing special about it. He's been flirting for a long time, and, you know, performance evaluation is ahead. I thought, why not? She shook her head. Ah, uh, was all I could squeeze out. Don't be like that, she said. That's how it all started. Their affair. Kate didn't lie to me, but she didn't have to, because I understood her code. I have to stay late at work, meant that he invited her to dinner and then to long sex, 
most likely at one of the many nearby hotels. This code meant that I was on my own for dinner and she wouldn't be home until 11. I must say, however, that she was always home before midnight. I had my own code. When she said she needed to stay late, I always said, be careful. This was a reminder to use protection. Despite the fact that she slept with her boss, our sex life did not deteriorate one iota. The love on such nights was simply amazing. On those nights when Kate was working late, I still got mine. She would come home, give me a quick but thorough shower, and then tend to my needs. No matter what she did a few hours ago, she made it clear that I was the one she wanted. It was like her boss was the appetizer and I was the main course. Our relationship, our marriage seemed unaffected by this. Kate asked me if I wanted to have sex with someone else. Actually, I didn't want to. I was completely satisfied with Kate. Before I met Kate, I was a loner, and at heart I remained the same. This situation continued for almost a year until Kate became pregnant, and then everything changed. Charlie was mine. We did a DNA test. He turned out to be my son. Kate kept her word. Although she cheated, she always used protection. We didn't use protection because Kate was on the pill. It turns out that the pills can be 93 to 99% effective, depending on how closely a woman follows the instructions. Kate may or may not have made a mistake or two. 99% will never equal 100. It's just statistics. Ask anyone who plays poker. He will tell you about bad luck. 40 weeks. Kate carried Charlie for 40 weeks. She became big and round. Hormones cause mood swings. Sometimes it felt like I was living with a stranger. About halfway through I came home and found her crying on the sofa. I hugged her and whispered that everything would be fine. I don't think she believed me. After a few minutes the tears stopped and we just held each other. Then she looked into my eyes as if searching for something. I don't know if she found what she was looking for, but she started talking. Forgive me for cheating, she said. Tears flowed again. I'm so sorry, Neil. You don't deserve this from me. You were kind and supportive from our first date, and I was selfish. I'm so sorry, she shook her head. I will never cheat on you again, I promise. I told her that the past doesn't matter and that when Charlie is born, we will be a family. We will love each other, I promised. I really meant it. We will be a family, like in the movies. She moved about a foot away from me, still sitting on the couch in our two-story condominium in Torrance. She looked into my eyes again for a long time. Finally, she began to speak again. Her voice was more like a whisper. You deserve to know why I did what I did. I owe you this. You don't owe me anything. Yes, I should. She took a deep breath and wiped her eyes. You know I had men before you when we started dating. I told you. Yes, it was that frat guy. The one who never called you again after that incident is a bastard. She nodded. Yes, this was my first time. But I... I never told you the whole truth. She looked away and then looked into my eyes again. I felt Kate muster the will to tell me what she was about to say. My first time was with a frat guy. At the fraternity house. She took a deep breath. But he was not alone. There were three other guys there that night. She began to cry again. Her voice became hoarse, although she was almost whispering at that moment. It wasn't consensual, Neil. They got me drunk. You know what happened next. Now I was crying too. We both cried. I hugged her. We cried and held each other. So I think my desire to control my sexuality comes from there. I have a control problem, so I like to be on top, and I never want you to tie me up or do anything to hurt me. She sighed. And maybe that's the reason why I decided to cheat on you. It was my way of controlling who could have sex with me, because one day I couldn't control it. I'm so sorry, I said. And I'm so sorry if I hurt you. You don't deserve this, Neil. You didn't deserve what happened to you. But we can start again, right? Start from scratch. Just being a loving family, never hurt each other. She nodded. I'd like that, she finally said. We hugged again, cried, and then kissed and went upstairs to the bedroom, 
where Kate literally drove me crazy in bed. Sometimes the hormones worked in my favor. Either way, Charlie was mine. Kate was in labor for 25 hours. She carried Charlie for nine months and then spent another day in labor. It was a difficult birth. Charlie was a big kid. I wish it could be like it used to be when Dad was just waiting outside and nervously pacing back and forth. I saw things I never wanted to see. Kate was exhausted, but she wasn't allowed to rest because she still had to feed our newborn. Due to a difficult birth, she and Charlie remained in the hospital for two more days before being released. I was with them most of this time. When we got home, Maria called and said she was waiting at Lax and where we were. The last thing I wanted was to deal with my mother-in-law, especially now, never if I had a choice. But I had no choice because she had gotten on a plane from Dulles Airport and was now waiting at Lax. She left Julio at home to manage his optical store. She never told us she was coming. I hope she told Julio, because otherwise he will be puzzled where his wife of about 25 years went. I made sure Kate and Charlie were okay, and then drove to Lax to pick up my bossy, red-headed mother-in-law. She stood on the sidewalk as hundreds of people walked past her and her mountain of luggage. My first thought when I saw her was, where the hell are all these suitcases going to fit? My second thought was that Maria looked good. I haven't seen her for at least two years. She was about 45 or 46 years old at the time, if my memory serves me correctly. She was pale, as befits a Virginian. She still had that bright red hair that brought out her paleness. Then I noticed her incredibly large breasts, supported by a bra that was probably at least 40 dd maybe more. Her hips were wide. Her ass was still as big and round as before. She hasn't changed at all in the two years that I haven't seen her. She got into the car and waited patiently while I Tetris styled her luggage into the trunk and into the back seat. When I realized that she had packed for at least a month, I began to worry. How am I going to tolerate Maria for a month? We didn't talk much on the way home. Our condo was small about 1,900 square feet. Two-story. Bedroom with bath on the top floor along with Charlie's nursery and another bathroom. On the ground floor, there was a kitchen and a living room with a folding sofa. We had a guest bathroom on the first floor, but it didn't have a shower. Maria will have to sleep on the couch and use Charlie's bathroom. It was the only way it could work. So, Maria, how long do you plan to stay? I asked on the way home. Please, Lord, let it only be for a week, I prayed. Are you ready to get rid of me, Neil? She asked. Yes, I thought. But he said out loud, not really, just trying to understand. I will stay here as long as Catherine needs my help, she said in a tone that was usually used with idiots. Maybe for a week, maybe two, maybe longer. I will leave when she no longer needs me and not before. I sighed quietly. I was looking forward to some time with Kate and my newborn son to spend time together and bond. After all, I only had two weeks of maternity leave, which was granted to me reluctantly and only because it was required by law. Now it looked like my two weeks would be spent taking care of my exhausted wife, my baby, and my damn mother-in-law. These two weeks went surprisingly well. Maria showed me her other side, tender, loving. She found reserves of energy within herself that I never knew about. She was everywhere cooking, cleaning, holding Charlie while Kate took long, relaxing baths. She made grocery lists and sent me on shopping missions. Her culinary repertoire was limited. It was mostly eras con palo and other Mexican dishes. But I had already lived in Southern California for two years, so Mexican food was quite to my taste. Maria was a good cook. About the third day, I realized that without Maria, we would have been lost. I never realized how much work a newborn requires or how slowly Kate would recover from everything she had been through. In fact, Kate never fully recovered. Instead, she simply survived. She went from one crisis to another usually involving Charlie and his ability to scream at a volume that was probably illegal. If it weren't for Maria, I don't think we would have made it. We worked out a system where Kate would pump and we would feed Charlie while she tried to sleep. You know that feeling when you're too tired to sleep? Yes, it was Kate. 
She could sleep for about 45 minutes before something woke her up. Maybe Charlie was crying. Maybe someone was rattling pots in the kitchen. Or maybe it's her own pains and ailments. Childbirth was hard on her body. I was there for the entire 25 hours, but let's be honest, I didn't help in any way. Kate did everything. I just coached her as best I could. Kate took on all the work and her body slowly recovered. I think it was frustrating for both of us. I knew sex would be out of our lives for at least three weeks after Charlie was born. But Kate's behavior made me wonder if we could ever have sex again. Even if she was ready, there would never be a right moment. Little Charlie was her priority almost every waking minute. He was a priority for both of us. We got through those first two weeks, and then I had to go back to work. The analyzes began to pile up because some of the tasks required my unique combination to be removed. The first day I returned to work, it was hard to say goodbye to Kate and Charlie. For some reason, it was also hard for me to say goodbye to Maria. Maria literally pushed me out of the house that morning. Let's, she ordered, go to your job or whatever you are doing. Forward, her voice softened. We can handle this, Neil. I nodded and left. After a long half hour, I was sitting at my desk in a room hidden from prying eyes. Even though I tried to focus on work, part of me still wondered how my family was doing without me. How is Kate coping? Is Charlie crying or maybe sleeping? What does Maria cook for dinner? When the day came to an end, I cleaned up and hurried home, glad to have a family waiting for me, even if it now included one unplanned extra family member. It seems like an unexpected plot twist has been added to my movie-like life. The problem arose with sex, or rather, with its absence. Three weeks passed, but Kate still wasn't ready for sex. We talked about it. She didn't know when she would be ready. I want you to be happy, she said, but I can't yet. Sex was the force that united us and kept us together. I think the problem started with her postpartum body. She no longer felt attractive which, in my opinion, was not true, but she did not listen to me. Add in pain, hormones and fatigue, as well as body image issues, and I began to worry that my wife might be experiencing postpartum depression. I began to think that she should see a therapist. Maybe we should both see a therapist. But every time I tried to suggest that counseling could help us deal with this problem, she started crying and the conversation ended there. Somewhere between weeks three and four, I realized that even though I loved Charlie, fatherhood sucked. Over time, I continued to try to seduce my wife, but without much success. She just wasn't ready for sex, neither physically nor emotionally. She continued to focus on Charlie's needs rather than mine. I understood her priorities, at least intellectually. This was a temporary phase, and I needed to be patient. That's how I calmed myself down. Friday fourth week of Charlie's life. It's been a long work week, but the backlog of analysis tasks is almost over. I stopped by the gym and got home around 7.30 p.m. When I arrived, Kate and Charlie were already asleep. Maria made Eros con Paolo again, and I reheated dinner in the microwave. He poured himself a glass of Syrah, then poured another. Maria joined me at the table. I poured her a glass, and she sipped the wine, looking at me. She told me about the day, how Charlie's day went. I noticed something was wrong with her this evening. Maria seemed to be in pain. When I asked her about this, she brushed me off. It's no big deal, she said. Just a spasm in the muscle. Tomorrow everything will be fine. I nodded. What could I say? When I got upstairs, I checked on Charlie. He slept peacefully. The little guy slept through the night almost every night, thank God. I don't know what we would have done if he hadn't slept. After checking on my son, I went into our bedroom and began to get ready for bed. Kate stirred as I lay down next to her. I turned her over on her stomach and started massaging her back. I did it gently but persistently, hoping that my massage would lead to something more. But like the entire past month, this was not the case. Kate sighed. I'm sorry, Neil, she said. I just can't. I can't yet. When will you be ready? I asked, trying to hide the irritation in my voice. Is there something I can do? She sighed again. 
I don't know when I'll be ready. There's nothing you can do. Now I sighed. I turned away and thought about the dream. Neither of us was ready for bed. Kate tossed and turned restlessly on her side, and I tried to find a comfortable position on mine. Several minutes passed like this. Perhaps an hour passed, or perhaps two. It was a long night. At least tomorrow is Saturday, and I can sleep. There is one thing you can do, Kate said, interrupting my unsuccessful attempts to sleep. I turned on my side to look at her. What? My mother, she said. Her back hurts. Today she pulled it. She held Charlie and bent over to put away the dishwasher soap. I think she pulled a muscle. Kate looked at me. She's really hurt. And? And you can go downstairs and give her a massage, she said, as if I was an idiot. The same way you massaged my back tonight. She smiled slightly. It was nice, if I could. Her sentence was cut off. I knew what she wanted to say. Do you think I can do the same for Maria? I wanted to make sure I understood what I heard correctly. Should I massage her back? Kate nodded. Yeah, try to relax her muscles a little. I nodded in response. I put on a robe and went downstairs to my mother-in-law. The TV was on downstairs. Maria loved to watch TV in the evenings. I think it helped her sleep because the TV was on every night when I went to bed and was still on every morning when I got up to make coffee before work. The volume was never high, but the flashing images seemed to calm her down. Her eyes were closed. She snored quietly. She was wrapped in a blanket, and underneath, she was wearing a robe. Under the robe was something like a moo, moo made of thick cotton material, covering her from her neck to her ankles. When I asked why she needed so many layers, Maria said they helped her stay warm at night. I turned off the TV and walked over to the sofa bed. As I got closer, I saw Mary's eyes open. She looked at me. Kate asked me to come down and rub your back, I told her. She says you pulled her too hard. I already told you, this is nonsense. It's clear, but Kate doesn't think so, so I'm going to give you a massage. Turn over on your stomach. I didn't specifically say, please. She did as I asked turned over. I pulled back the blanket, leaving her in her robe and nightgown. Her huge ass stuck out like a miniature Everest. Maria was almost twice my age, and although she was a full foot shorter than me, she weighed about the same as me. Most of this weight was on her breasts and ass, but not all of it, of course. Thank you for everything you do for us, I said. But the fact is that everything got out of control, and the massage smoothly turned into sex. Good night, Maria, I finally said. I hope you enjoyed your massage. You know I liked it, bastard, she replied in Spanish. See you in the morning. I walked up the stairs to my bedroom. When I opened the door, Kate was awake and looking at me. You stink, she said. Take a shower before you go to bed. I waited for some other reaction, but got nothing but a sigh. Wash up and go to bed, Neil, she said. Over the next three weeks, we developed a certain routine. When Charlie fell asleep at night, I would hug Kate and ask if she was ready for sex. She always answered, No, not yet, but soon. I nodded, kissed her, and then went downstairs to massage Maria. When I came downstairs, Maria was already in bed. She usually wore a nightgown, but not always. Sometimes she would wait for me naked, this situation continued for about three more weeks until Kate said she had had enough. Everything was going well at work. My sex life is back to normal, or even better than it was before thanks to Maria. Charlie felt great. Kate and Maria looked amazing. Life was good. Maria had been with us for about eight weeks at that time. Kate was halfway through her maternity leave. We will need to start looking at options for a daycare center soon. As it turned out, the women in my life decided how child care would be organized. One evening, I came home after showering after the gym. Before I could eat, Kate took me to our bedroom and closed the door. Mom doesn't want to leave, she said. What? She says she wants to stay with us and take care of Charlie when I go back to work. Kate looked at me as if this was somehow my fault. 
In some ways, perhaps it was. What about Julio? Do you know her husband? What does he think about her staying with us? Forever. I don't think mom gave him a say. This is crazy. I know. But you could look at it from my point of view. Do you really think I want my husband to have sex with my mother every night? That's it. She had never brought this up before, but now she did. I mean, we never hit it not that we could, because Maria could be very loud, but we never talked about it. Now we have spoken. I don't want to have sex with Maria, I said. You know what I want. Kate nodded. She looked distant for a moment, as if gathering her strength. I know what you want. I think, I think I'm ready to give you what you want now. I don't want you to do anything you're not ready for, I said. I remember you telling me about your first. Kate silenced me with her finger and then replaced it with her lips. We had become strangers over the past two months, but were now starting to get to know each other again. We made love. That night we didn't go down again. The next morning I explained to Maria that everything was over between us. I got my family back and I never intended to lose it. But it wasn't all over between Maria and me. Not really. For now. Kate and Maria held some negotiations. The final agreement looked like this. Maria would stay until we found a daycare center for Charlie. When Charlie goes to kindergarten, Maria will return to Virginia, where Julio will be waiting for her. In the meantime, I will spend one night a week with Maria Friday. That night we could do whatever we wanted. But the other six nights I'll be with Kate. It's like rent, Kate explained. She lives here for free, eats our food. Yes, she helps with Charlie, but I don't need as much help as I used to. So, she has to pay rent, once a week. And you agree with this? Kate shrugged. Yes, no, not really. I just looked at her. Okay, I'm not sure how I feel about this. I feel like, I think now I understand how you felt when I cheated on you, right? It's like, my world is no longer as safe as I thought it was. I nodded. It's like your world has been turned upside down. Yes, I still love you, and, and I still love you. Right, but now there's a third party, and, Maria. Yes, Mom. And it hurts, but not that much, because I know. You know that I still love you, and that's forever. Well, I know you interrupt me all the time. Don't be such a bore, you bastard. I laughed. We kissed, and then we did more. Everything is back to normal. It's time for the film to end on a happy note. An interesting thing happened when Kate returned to work. You could say there was another unexpected plot twist. We found a daycare for Charlie. It was damn expensive, but when we did the math, it turned out that Kate was still worth continuing to work, even though most of her afterpay income was going toward daycare fees. We have greatly reduced the number of trips to restaurants to stay within the budget. With Charlie, there was simply no point in spending money on expensive dinners when he was going to cry most of the time anyway. Maria returned to Virginia to Julio. I don't know what story she told him, or whether he even asked why she stayed with us for four months instead of two or three weeks. We spent our last night together with Kate's blessing and did everything we could think of. At least I gave her something to remember. Kate's boss continued to flirt with her, wanting to rekindle their pre-pregnancy relationship. This time she firmly told him no, repeatedly, but he continued to insist. He offered her a big promotion if she accepted and threatened to demote her if she didn't give him what he wanted. From his point of view, he was quite reasonable, because all he wanted was to get back what they had before. Nothing more. He didn't understand why Kate kept telling him no. He made a big mistake when he linked her salary to her willingness to give in. Kate contacted HR. He claimed their relationship was consensual, but Kate provided HR investigators with recent emails that showed that, whatever it had been before, it was now non-consensual. The quid pro quo demands clearly indicated sexual harassment. Everything was clear and unambiguous, at least according to the lawyers. Kate was transferred to another position, far away from her previous boss. The salary remained the same, but there was less work. She got bored, 
she ended up suing the company for retaliation because her new job did not have the same level of responsibility as her previous one, despite the same salary. Remember, we were in California. Labor laws work differently here. In short, Kate was offered a very generous settlement, one that would allow her to stay home with Charlie for the next three years if she wanted. Kate didn't want this. We used the money from this agreement as a down payment on a new, larger house. Three months later, Kate went back to work, earning even more money than before. As we knew, her current security clearance and Pentagon experience were highly regarded within the defense industry. In fact, her new job was in the marketing department. It turned out that she knew all the right people in the Pentagon and the rules of the game. She knew who to talk to and what the limits were to keep those conversations ethical. Her new employer was delighted with her and rewarded her accordingly. Soon Kate was earning much more than me. The only downside to her new job was the frequent business trips. We found a way to handle her travel by hiring a nanny, an au pair from Finland, who could pass my agency's security check. The au pair spoke English but wanted to improve her skills we worked on her language skills as part of the payment for her services. When Kate left, she may have been cheating with someone. I don't know and never asked her about it. Just like she never asked me what Ivy and I did when she was out winning and dining with the generals and congressional staff. What happened between us and other people was carefully kept separate, hidden from our marriage. Keeping such sensitive information, a secret allowed our marriage to remain strong for many years. This approach allowed Charlie to have a sister, Mary, three years later. When Mary was born, her namesake returned to California. The first thing Maria said when she arrived at our house was how much her back hurt after the long flight. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.